We are live. Thanks. Good. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for selecting my presentation today, how to implement evidence-based practices for autism to support social emotional learning for autistic students. Um, and so we're going to be here together from 1.30 to 2.30. If you have any questions, just put them in the chat um, and feel free to do that throughout the presentation. And I don't mind you know, if there's something I don't understand what you just meant or is there, uh, please feel free to ask. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, your learning objectives is uh, my goal is to make sure you learn about the evidence based practices for social emotional learning that have been proven effective for students on the autism spectrum. And then uh, to gain access to free resources, I forget to put that in there, for training staff to effectively implement these EBPs for social emotional learning with students on the autism spectrum. So first, it's probably helpful to know how many students we have in our California schools with autism. That's when you all have checked that box and said they're eligible for special ed under the category autism. And our last count is that there's 133,199 students in California, and those are just the 21 numbers. So um, every year you can see that it increases and there's certainly a need for us to pay attention to our students with autism. Um, they tend to be complex learners uh, and need some complex supports to really receive equity and access in our educational programs. And uh, you're all at the Inclusion Collaborative Conference because you, as the research says, believe that when there's an increase in successful opportunities to be included in the least restrictive environment, and I always say successfully included, um, that we have better outcomes. And that's the goal of what we're doing here today. Um, I am the co-coordinator of CAPTAIN and uh, for those of you who don't know who we are, we're a multi-agency network. We've been around for quite a while. I think we're on our 10th year. Uh, we came out of the Legislative Blue Ribbon Commission report in 2007. And we are unique in that we're a, a multi-agency entity. Um, we have membership and captain with regional center individuals, special education, local plan areas, our SELPAs and our schools, our state and federally funded family support entities and higher education. And these are all of our partners across California that you can take a, a look at. And the reason why we think this is important is that there are many individuals and service providers and families who really um, interface with individuals with autism. And so it's important that we're all on the same page. Um, Captain is now, since 2018, uh, part of California's statewide system of support. And these are just kind of interestingly, all of those other entities that are part of California's statewide system of support that are out there to help all of you really provide uh, equity and access to um, our students with disabilities in our educational system. So these are the tiers of captain's support. So we have that universal support. So I encourage all of you, I don't know if you can multitask and go check out our captain website. You're gonna find all kinds of free stuff on there. And just know that they're, they are all research-based and evidence-based. So we have infographics and we have trainings and a special page just for families and family service providers. We have a special page just for regional center workers that are highly specific to the work that they're doing to serve individuals and families affected by autism. When you look at our targeted support, you can see that we have 419 captain cadre in California, um, and they represent all of those different entities. And then with this grant that we received, uh, in 2018, we're able to really provide direct support to develop some demonstration programs for students with autism. So, you know, everybody can go take a look and go, oh, that's what a good program for individuals with autism is supposed to look like. So this is just the demographic of CAPTAIN, just so you know, of course, the bulk is uh, in our schools because 
you know, we have 133,000 plus students with autism in our schools, but you can see we're well represented by those regional centers. There's 21 out of 21 regional centers. So they've all committed to learning about what these EVPs for autism are and making sure their vendors are actually, you know, vendorized to provide research-based, evidence-based practices for individuals with autism. We keep growing our family support agencies. We're very much uh, indebted to them. They are the ones that in 2006 got up, went up to Sacramento and said, you're not doing enough for individuals and families affected by autism. And out of that did come that legislative blue ribbon committee, which uh, we were on. And out of that came the report, which said, you know, there needs to be a clearinghouse. Everybody needs to know what these EBPs are for autism. And that's kind of the inception of CAPTAIN. And so then finally we have the universities because what's really important is as we've gotten out into the schools is we wanna make sure that teacher preparation, school psychologist preparation, APE, all of those individuals who work in our schools really understand what autism is. And so we, we've added our higher ed professors to be a part of our work so that, you know, those who are going to go into education are really prepared um, to provide the uh, supports and services in our schools for individuals with autism. So I talked about those 419 captain cadre and you may go, well, who's mine? Well, you can see that on the captain um, state that we have here, we've divided the state of California into 17 regions. It's, it's the old saying of how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Because California is huge, right? And we even have uh, LAUSD, which is the second largest school district in the United States of America. So we have a huge state. We have a lot of individuals with autism. And so we divided the state into 17 areas. They're all called captain regions. You can see right here all of their names. And then if you want to know who your people are that you can contact, their requirements to be a member of captain is to be responsive to those who contact them and say, hey, they also put on trainings and workshops in their local areas, et cetera. And so this is how you find out who your captain cadre are. As I mentioned, we have this grant. And so we partnered with the SELPA directors and regional implementation leads for all 17. And so with this grant money, we're able to pay some money to the SELPA and to a regional implementation lead who can oversee the work in those particular regions. And this is a list of, you know, the captain region, the SELPA that's taking the lead on the work and the regional implementation lead that is an expert in autism. And this is who your leadership is for your particular region. And um, you can contact all of them at their SELPAs. So when you look at captain by the numbers, sometimes people say, so what are you doing? <laughs> like, how much are you doing? Um, and so when you look at just our 21-22 numbers, you can see that 6.6 thousand took a look at our website. We look at our Facebook page, which I encourage you to take a look at. It's the up-to-the-date information about autism and what's going on and trainings in your area and new evidence-based practices that peer-reviewed journals have uh, figured out that work to improve outcomes for individuals with autism. And then there's these free online affirm modules, which I'll tell you about, which is how you can learn free how to uh, understand what an evidence-based practice is for autism and how to implement it with fidelity. So why are we so focused on evidence-based practices? Well, on um, if you did a Google search for autism treatment, you can see that on September 30th, I did that and I found 305 million hits for the answer to what are the treatments for autism. And then I did it again the other day, October 11th, and got 351 million hits. And there, there are not that many evidence-based practices, but you can see that there's a myriad of treatments for autism and they're more diverse than any other known disability. Um, those treatment claims range from amelioration to recovery, and most of them really have no scientific evidence. And they, they, they're recommending that you spend money and go find people who are experts in things that really don't have the research to support that it's worth that time, money, effort, energy to implement. 
Um, you know, before I do this training, every time I go on Google because if there was a, a cure for autism or if we had figured out what causes autism, it certainly would make international news. And at this point, we don't really know what causes autism. We also don't have a cure for autism. And the neurodiversity community would, would beg to say, why are you looking for a cure? Do you not appreciate me as an individual with autism? Why would you want to prevent more of me from coming into this world? Um, and why would you want to cure me? What, what's wrong with me that you would want to cure me? Um, and so it has shifted now for what the research is doing and lots of money is really going on. How can we be supportive? How can we have individuals with autism be an integral member of our autism planning? And if they want to improve their social skills or their social interactions or their communication, that they're a member of that design team to figure out, you know, what is it that they want to do so that they can navigate this, this journey of life, um, knowing that they are neurodiverse. So, why do we use evidence-based practices and interventions in special education? Well, in the United States, you guys all know that there's federal law and state education codes that actually require us to use these. Um, so when you look at the idea of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or the ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act and the California Ed Code, they all say, you gotta use evidence-based practices. So it's not really, do we feel like it, or do we want to, or why can't I use this thing over here? Um, it's because we are required by law to use evidence-based practices. And the reasoning is, is because we know they work, because they've been determined through peer review uh, analysis and research, and they've been replicated using really rigorous uh, assessments. Um, and we also know that the reason why we use uh, evidence-based practices is even in clinical practice, you know, like when we talk about insurance and for other kind of agencies or groups and bodies of specialists or providers for individuals with disabilities, um, it's governed by their ethics that they will use those as well. But we always like to say the most important reason to do these evidence-based practices is because they do work. And so now you're going, what are these evidence-based practices? And trust me, I'm going to get to social emotional learning, but I think it's important for all of us to have shared understanding of what are these EBPs for autism that can support social emotional learning. So this is the definition of an evidence-based practice. It's an intervention or practice for which there's scientifically based research that demonstrates its effectiveness. And they are practices that rely on rigorous, systematic, and objective procedures to deliver reliable results, meaning we need to implement the uh, evidence-based practice the way the research said it would be effective with fidelity. And then when we look at the report that I just mentioned, um, the focused intervention practices have evidence of efficacy in promoting positive outcomes for learners with autism. So these are the 28 evidence-based practices. Take a little bit of a look. Your favorite one may not be on there, and it might be a surprise to you. But these are those that have been researched rigorously. And not only have they been, have they been researched by one researcher, but multiple researchers have done the exact same research and come up with the same finding, meaning it's been replicated. So it's really important that we adhere to these. It takes a lot of work and time to become an evidence-based practice. These are those, and we don't, I can't list everything that doesn't have sufficient evidence to meet the criteria for an evidence-based practice, but these are some of the popular ones that are out there for individuals with autism, and you can find this on page 31, that do not have evidence to meet criteria as an evidence-based practice. And you may see some on there that you are familiar with. And so I do hope you have an aha. So where do you find this report that describes all of this research and the outcomes and the findings? Well, it's the National Clearinghouse on Autism Evidence and Practice. 
Um, I've given you the website here. You can also get to it from the Captain website so you don't have to memorize or figure out what that URL is. But this is the one that has the report. And what they've done is they've been doing this work um, for a while, initially through the National Professional Development Center on Autism. And then as they moved forward, it became the National Caring Health and Autism Evidence and Practice. It is the same researchers to take a look at all the research. Basically, I think it goes back to 1957 and all the peer review journals, the respective peer review journals, and look at the outcomes of the research to determine these are the ones that meet our standards to be considered one of the 28 evidence-based practices for autism. On the CAPTAIN website, you can go find this under the resources. And this is a matrix, it's just kind of a, a, a one-page view of those evidence-based practices. And across the top, you'll see these domain areas, meaning these evidence-based practices may help and address these areas. And down the left-hand side are the abbreviations of the 28 evidence-based practices. So you might say, oh, look, AAC. Well, it works with this age group for academic and pre-academic findings. For this group, oh, but not really a lot of research for this age group, 15 to 22, to promote academic, pre-academic outcomes. And these are the things, if you go to the trainings by your local captain cadre, they can spend a whole hour and a half teaching you all about these evidence-based practices. But if you want to do some learning, and we do require all of our captain cadre to participate in these, you can go to these free high-quality trainings. They're called Autism Focus Intervention Resources and Modules, and they're free. And those of you who need to get CEUs for speech and language or BCBAs, they actually count because they're based out of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. They're authorized to give CEUs um, and also, you have to pay a little bit if you want to do it the CEU route, but it's free if you do it without that. Um, and there is a learning module for most of the clinical evidence-based practices. So on that and in those modules, you'll find what we call implementation checklist, meaning making sure you're implementing it with fidelity so that you have the same outcome that the research says it's going to be effective. There's lots of parent guides, so if you want to share those with parents, and then there's also videos because we all know, you know pictures worth a thousand words and the video is worth even more to see what an EDP looks like in action. This is the implementation checklist, which is kind of our, we call it the holy grail, so that when we go in, it can help you with planning how you can use the EDP. It helps the implementers self reflect on the fidelity of use. So that when I go out and I do some coaching and they go, you know, I was using. Uh, self-management EDP and it wasn't working and I don't think it's good for this kid. I think let's get the implementation checklist and see how it's being implemented. And so oftentimes as we walk through that, we go, oh whoops, you're not doing step four. Maybe that's why it's not working. Let's add that in. And so it really helps us as coaches give objective feedback as well as the implementer to kind of go, okay, am I doing this? I'm doing this and I'm doing this. The implementation uh, checklist also helps to prevent drift because I think we all know that when you're implementing uh, anything, um, you know, somehow it's the human condition to try to really shorten it up and do it the most expedient, kind of least energetic way. Um, but sometimes it really has to be implemented the way the research says, and it's a little bit more uh, in depth than maybe it's doesn't go fast enough, but you know what they say, haste makes waste. Um, I think these were very, very important. Um, so these were developed just for parent educators and uh, speech language uh, pathologist uh, assistants. So these are designed for those individuals who are supporting individuals with autism in a variety of contexts. So they chose the kind of the top five the firm modules and said paraprofessionals might benefit from specific training just for them about reinforcement or prompting or supporting peer interaction. Why aren't all the tasks that we expect our instructional specialists to be doing? Um, time delay. Sometimes when we talk about prompting, part of that is 
I'm going to just wait a little bit to see how they do. Um, and then visual cues and those visual supports that are so important for individuals with autism. Um, these were uh, very helpful during the pandemic when uh, I think administrators were saying, you know, we don't want to lose our paraeducators. What can we be doing? And we can they can do these modules. We can use some of that time if they're not busy helping with distance learning to build their capacity and understanding how they can support individuals with autism. So these were very helpful during that time and continue to be after that. Okay, let's get started. Are there any questions? I'm not able to see the chat, but I think I have someone there that can read into the chat and see if anybody's asking questions at this point. Okay, I think silence is golden. So how do we improve outcomes for students with autism? Now we're going to start talking about this social emotional learning. Very important, especially after the pandemic, that we pay attention to social emotional issues that are going on with probably all of our students and even the educators. Um, and so there's a whole web page by the California Department of Education about the focus of social emotional learning going forward for sure in our schools. We have, and the Department of Education has embraced CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. And they have the CASEL office, and I'm going to talk about those today. This is the website for CASEL, so we can go on and learn some more. Many of you are probably already engaging in SEL uh, going on in your schools or school districts, etc. So the CASEL 5, when you look at the guidelines in these broad inter areas of competence, um, there's self-awareness, there's the area of self-management, there's the social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. So what we know is that the CASEL 5 can actually be taught and applied at various development, developmental stages, and most importantly, across diverse cultural contexts. And the way they do that is if you look at kind of the, the third bullet, that the stakeholders should decide how best to prioritize the teach and assess the growth and development of these kind of lives in the local schools and communities. As you know, we everywhere you go, even in every different school, there's a completely different culture. And so it needs to be tailored so that it's meaningful and responsive to whatever conditions are located there. Our role with captain is that when these individuals or school districts are providing social emotional learning, that we make sure that our individuals with autism are also having shared equity and access to that really important area of growth and attention. And so when we look at the social emotional learning, this infographic is something we made. Um, so we took that CASEL 5 diagram and then with each one, we said these are the evidence-based practices for autism that will support self-awareness. These are those EBTs for autism that will support social awareness. These are the EBTs that will support relationship skills, and so on. And so what we've tried to do is give you this infographic. So as you go in and you say, hey, I have a student with autism, and he's participating in this SEO curriculum. Um, these are the EDCs that can be helpful so that they can have increased equity and access to that same curriculum and benefit from it. Now, you saw the title of the presentation was about Tier 2 and Tier 3, Evidence-Based Practices to Support SEL Learning. But we don't want to forget to remind everyone that really we need to really be implementing very good Tier 1 supports from CBIS. And this is from the California PBIS Coalition. And I think this data is really powerful. Um, and I put down here if you want to learn about what tier one positive behavior intervention supports are, you can go to this website. But this data is from an article, the Journal of Exceptional Children. Um, and it's, it's really important for us to get these findings. And it's really about. Um, finding that a student is 37% less likely to have received one out of school suspension if these tier one PBIS supports are in place. A Hispanic student is 33% less likely to have received one out of school suspension. 
just a student is 37% less likely to have received one or more out of school suspension. An African American student is 28% less likely to have received two or more out of school suspension. And a student is 35% less likely to lose a day of instruction. So you can see how beneficial tier one can be for all students. However, when we look at this final boy, a student with a disability is 69% less likely to be referred to an alternative setting for disciplinary reasons. And if that's not a powerful statistic to say we really should be implementing good tier one CBIS, I don't know what it is because you can see that this is really going to be helpful for equity and so that we're not disproportionate in those who are actually in the lab with the behavioral responses for out of school suspensions or behavioral reports. So we're really a proponent of the tiered system of support for behavioral interventions. And, you know, we're not saying just be tier two and tier three today. We're saying let's also get tier one in place. So here we go. It's really important for us to start digging in here with these capital five. But I wanted to point out this this morning, but I just added it this morning. But what they said was we, this capital, believe it is most beneficial to integrate SEL throughout the school's academic curricula and culture across the broader context of school-wide practices and policies and through ongoing collaboration with families and community organizations. And so, you know, the theme of the inclusion collaborative is always about how to have successful inclusive education opportunities for our students uh, with disabilities. And they're also saying, let's integrate it within, you know, the school's academic curricula and culture. And that's what we're saying in promoting and supporting as well today. So let's first take a look at relationship skills, which you know is the ability to establish and maintain healthy and supportive relationships. And these are all the, the guidelines and standards that we would address when building relationship skills in an SEL program. So communicating effectively and developing positive relationships resolving conflicts constructively, showing leadership in groups, all of these things. And so when we look at what evidence-based practice for individuals with autism can be supportive of developing relationship skills. So if you're doing an SEL curriculum. So one of them is the social skills training, which is an evidence-based practice for autism. And that means that the research says there is supportive information that makes it an evidence-based practice that if we implement it with fidelity, we can address and improve uh, social skills for it. Hi, Ann. Yes. Hey, sorry about that. I started to interject. It seems that we are having some audio issues. Your audio has gone a little bit, um, or maybe more than just a little bit muddy. Uh, okay. Couple minutes. Is Oh, just a few minutes ago? Yes. Okay. Does, is it better or worse right now? I can lean forward. It is better now. Okay. Well, I'll just give you guys a big face of me and keep doing it then. Okay. Is this okay? Okay. I'm going to keep going. So when we look at social skills training, um, PEERS is the only social skills training for evidence-based practices for autism. It's also what we call a manualized intervention meeting criteria as an EBP or what we call a MIMC. Um, so PEERS is really out of UCLA. There's an evidence-based practice description of it on the AFFIRM module right in here. And if you want to learn more about PEERS, you can go to the, their Facebook page, which I gave you a link to, or their website. Um, they have a free online library of social skills video examples so that you can show an example and a non-example because we do know that video modeling is very helpful for our individuals with autism and there's research to support that. So there's lots of video modeling of appropriate behaviors or more effective social behaviors and those that are non-examples. Um, and again, I have a link there so you can go look at those videos. And if you want to get trained in peers, uh, we actually did kind of, I think, the fall of 2021 
or 2020, I can't remember now, but uh, we actually trained uh, like probably over a hundred individuals of our captain cadre in the peers program. So if you go to their website and you look at California, you can see all of those that we trained in California who are certified in training in peers. Um, as I mentioned, video modeling is very helpful for individuals with autism. So if they observe something being modeled using a video, it can be very helpful. And there's different ways to provide video modeling that will support individuals. And again, just check out that Affirm module and it teaches you all about video modeling and how to implement it with fidelity with individuals with autism. So now we're going to move on to social awareness. And you can see right here, and then if you go to the EBPs for autism, these are the ones that will help with social awareness. However, I have to say this is a really challenging area for individuals with autism because it requires taking others' perspectives, re, you know, kind of recognizing strengths in others, demonstrating empathy and compassion, showing concerns for the feelings of others. You can see this whole list here about evident, uh, the standards that they've listed for social awareness. And this is kind of the hallmark characteristic of an individual with autism. So we're not gonna fix it or cure it, but what we can do is use evidence-based practices to support them in performing and engaging in all these activities. And so what you can see is when you look at all these SEL competencies, social stories and what we call power cards are the evidence-based practices for autism that would be very helpful. And so when you look at social narratives, it's the umbrella evidence-based practice for autism. And again, the research says in that report, as well as there's an affirm module to teach you all about these, social stories is one of the social narratives that shows research to be effective for individuals with autism. Carol Gray has developed these and they call them social stories and she continues to do research and update them. And uh, social stories 10.3 is what we also call a manualized intervention meeting criteria. I've seen a lot of social stories uh, out there in the world. Not all of them appear to be uh, kind of written with fidelity. Most of you probably know them, but when we look at them and we look at the fidelity checklist, um, they don't necessarily measure up. And so um, I encourage everyone to really uh, do the Affirm module because there's a whole section on how to write a social story the correct way. Because remember, we have to implement these the way the research says they're most effective. Otherwise, most of those stories are just interesting stories for, to read to our individuals with autism. But the concept is that the social story helps them perceive and understand what's going on around them. And so Carol Gray always says, be careful in there because what the social story does is it defines, explains, and describes the experience so that they can process it better. Um, I would encourage you to take a course from Carol Gray. We did offer that. And so we have many, many, many Captain Cadre who are now trained in how to write social stories. So again, go back, contact your Captain Cadre and say, hey, I wanna learn about social stories. Um, can you help me understand what those are? I think we trained over 200 individuals during the pandemic with Carol Gray teaching them really how to do that. The other social narrative evidence-based practice is called power cards. And these also help a learner understand the expectations during a particular situation. Um, and they're useful when the learner needs to understand a particular rule or is experiencing some kind of problem with their behavior. The most important thing is to make sure to include their special interests Sometimes when I go in to coach a program, they say, oh, you know, he really loves, uh, you know, Paw Patrol, so I hide everything uh, from them. And I, they go, it doesn't really work. And I go, I know, but the research says that if we take advantage or incorporate their special interests, there's gonna be 
more motivation. Now, if they become problematic or they become over-focused on them, that's another issue. And we can, we can use them for reinforcers or we can have schedules that say, we're going to do this, this, and this, and then you get Paw Patrol. And so we learn how to help them self-manage accessing something that's of particular interest to themselves. But let's always consider that the research tells us special interest is very important. It provides motivation and interest so that they want to pay attention to some of the things in school that maybe, um, you know, they don't want to, but they have to because it's, it's things that are important for them to learn. When you look at the criteria for writing a power card, you have to use that special interest. You have to take a look at what behavior you're looking at. It's always really super important to figure out what's the function of that behavior. Like, why are they, why are they doing that? And what might a replacement behavior be for that that's maybe more socially acceptable and allows them to have more access and inclusive responsiveness from others when they actually engage this way versus the other way. And then we have to kind of Always, we always say in Captain Data is delicious. So we have to have a baseline to see if what we're doing really is going to make a difference. I put in these snapshots to show you kind of the, the reasons and the directions on how to develop. But I do want to just show you some. And I want to show you this one. So the power card is a small card with a shortened version. So this one's special interest student was a construction worker. They love construction workers. And so you can see that the front first page is, number one, everyone has to follow directions. If your teacher, mom, or data asks dad to do something, you can say sure or okay. And then follow directions when your teacher, mom, or dad asks you to do something. And they're interested because construction workers do that. And they're very much into admiring construction workers. I just made this one because Steph Curry is our big Bay Area hero. But again, the front side of the card would say, Steph Curry is a great basketball player. He was not as tall as a lot of the other players, but he always did his best. He practiced his skills every day with hard work and practice, and he made the NBA. Steph wants you to know how he succeeded. And then on the back of the card, it's small. It's going to be like four by five. Number one, even when you do something you want to do is hard, you do not succeed, do not give up. Ask a teacher or parent to help you. Remember, you will get better with practice and hard work. Make a plan to practice. So power cards are very important, but they have to be made specifically paying attention to the interest and what the function of that behavior was. Here's just another one for SpongeBob for a student who likes that. Now, when we look at these other two areas, we decided to combine them. Um, so self-awareness and self-management go together. If you think about it, I have to be self-aware in order to self-manage, right? So we bundle these a little bit and you can see the evidence-based practices here. Now, when we look at self-awareness, it's just the ability to understand one's own emotions and thoughts and values and how they influence our behavior across contexts. So that means integrating your personal and social identities, demonstrating honesty, linking feelings and values and self-efficacy and this growth mindset. And then we have self-management, which is the ability to manage one's emotions and thoughts and behaviors effectively in different situations and to achieve goals and aspirations. So that means managing one's emotions, identifying using stress management strategies, exhibiting self-discipline, uh, having personal goals, showing the courage to take initiative and demonstrating personal and collective agency. So guess what? There is an evidence-based practice for autism that the research says is efficacious. It's called self-management. Um, you can read about it in the report and all the age groups and the outcomes for which it's effective. And then you can go on to the Affirm uh, free online and actually go in and take the Affirm module on how to set up self-management. We're going to give you a few examples here today. So basically, this is what it is. It's the process of teaching a learner to discriminate between appropriate and inappropriate behavior. 
and to accurately monitor and record their own behaviors eventually and reward themselves for appropriate behavior or use of the skill. The last thing we want is for really any of our students to be prompt dependent, always needing someone else telling us, telling and reminding what to do and, and when to do it. So it's important to start working on teaching them to recognize and be aware and then to also monitor that. So we can use different recording devices and methods. So they can, it doesn't have to be fancy. It can be paper, pencil or clickers or token boards. Um, using tickets or using technology. But again, what are we going to think about? What's most interesting for our individuals with autism that will get them to really engaging in this self-management, self-monitoring activity? Um, you can see there's a clicker here. Um, some individuals with autism may like to click every time and they like the sound of that or the pressure of their thumb on it. And they think that that's great. Or some may like tickets, you know, they're going to give you a ticket for something. Or you can use definitely technology, which is out there to do self-management. Um, I get that on my watch all the time. It's always telling me to breathe or stand up. So when you look at an example of paper and pencil, just for simple on task, and off task. We can have just this little tiny clipboard, my rules, feet near my own chair, squeeze the ball if I need to squeeze. And so the timer is here. Maybe you're gonna have it go off every so many seconds or minutes. Um, when the beep comes, then they just check, did I do that? What was I doing? And it doesn't have to be giant rocket science. I know we always ask for lots of data because it, you know, we think data is delicious and it's amazing and it's very helpful. But if collecting the data is difficult, people won't collect data and neither will our students. And so making it as simple and transparent and easy as possible is always the clue to being successful. This is another uh, example. Some individuals with autism really have favorite topics and they love to talk about them a lot. And that's okay. We all have favorite topics, but what we want to do is teach kind of time and place and how much. And so this is just a simple strategy where we can give the student maybe five talk tickets. And we've talked to them about, you know, you can talk about whatever Minecraft um, five times today and you get to decide, oops, 215, you get to decide, um, you know, when you're going to do that. But once your tickets are gone, then you're done. So we teach them how to self-manage and how to participate at that level on their own. Or you can provide them again with a self-monitoring charts. I have lots of individuals with autism. They love to check things off. I do too. I have like lost lists and I love to write everything down and check it off. Even when I've already done it, I still write it down and I cross it off because it makes me feel good. And so you can also use the clicker. So again, it's always about kind of figuring out what's going to be the path of least resistance, what's going to be easy and interesting and motivating to really do the self-management. Now, the incredible five-point scale is a research-based tool that's recommended, and it's also in our NCAPE report as uh, one that is really teaching how to monitor, for example, one vocal, con vocal volume. We know individuals with autism may have challenges when they're talking too loud, maybe in a classroom or uh, not loud enough somewhere else. Um, and so what you do, and this is on the Affirm module, it teaches you how to develop this, but you don't just present it. You actually work with the individual with autism and you say, okay, one, let's think about one. One's going to sound like this or two is going to sound like this. And so you work with them on identifying one equals this so that they've become a co-creator, a co-developer of this. So it's not like you've given it to them and you're doing it to them. What you're really doing is co-creating their opportunity to understand vocal volume in different contexts. And then what happens is, is they learn how to refer to it. And just like any kind of prompting, you might have it at their desk. And when maybe they're too loud, you can walk by and point to five and then tell them they need to be a three because guess where they are. So, and then eventually you can just say, check your 
check your vocal volume. So what we want to do is teach it so that they're not prompt dependent on us always going, look at your vocal volume, um, but that they can learn to really self-manage what that might be like. And this can also be used for anxiety scales. And again, it's a longer process where you sit there and you come up with the particular uh, icons or the what it looks like and what they can do when anxiety happens to them and what a one is versus a five. Um, so it takes a while, but someone will work with them to develop this anxiety scale just for them. So I wouldn't just say print this out and give it to any kid because it needs to be individualized uh, for that particular individual. But again, this is a research-based tool, the incredible five-point scale, and it can be used to take a look at what anxiety, which I think about 70% of individuals who have autism actually uh, may have another mental health uh, challenge, such as depression or anxiety or um, ADHD. Okay, so this is Nate just using his vocal volume meter at his desk. This is a real life student. He has it right there because he, he just kind of talks out a little bit loud and he realized that he caught himself afterward and everybody's looking at him. And so he was part of the decision, where is it gonna go? What does it need to look like, et cetera, et cetera. And it was portable because he was included. And so he took this as with his folder whenever he went to other classrooms to remind him. And then eventually, guess what? It got internalized. So now we're going to look at finally the responsible decision making part of SEL right here. And these are the EBPs. So responsible decision making is just how to make caring and constructive choices about personal behavior and social interactions across diverse situations. And so it's I think I think we're all on a journey to, to learn how to do this over our lifetime. And it's a skill that we learn through trial and error and I think it's wonderful that SEL curriculum is really addressing that, making good decisions, right? I do want to point out, though, that we have an evidence-based practice, of course, uh, one of the 28 called antecedent-based interventions. And two of the hallmark uh, aspects of antecedent-based intervention is those high interest activities. And the second one is making choices. Um, we know that classrooms, the more choices they have in there, we can see a direct decline in behavioral problems in those classrooms. Um, I also think making choices needs to start, you know, from the very beginning. And so even with our youngest students that we can start working on, you know, for snack, you know, do you want your carrot sticks or your celery sticks? Make a choice. And then as we think about our individuals who have more extensive or intensive needs, maybe our individuals who might perhaps be nonverbal or have cognitive impairments, um, this is so important to teach this cognitive skill of making choices. Um, and it just goes from, you know, you want a pencil or a pen, or do you want to do this or that um, for free choice? You know, do you want to do this or do that? And if you think about it, Offering a choice really takes care of a whole lot of things. First of all, you're going to show them a visual, but you're also going to say, what do you want? So the individual who's receiving that has to think about, oh, what do I want? And then they have to compare and contrast. And then they have to communicate to you whether they're going to point or do an eye gaze or just, you know, touch something that that's what they want. So we're working on receptive language. We're looking on cognitive skills, comparing and contrasting. We're working on expressing themselves. And we're also working on self-advocacy, right? Including our individuals. So no, we're not doing to them all day long, but they're giving this autonomy and opportunity to voice what they want to do. So now we're on the last little area. We have nine more minutes and then we'll be finished and might have time for more questions. Cognitive behavioral instructional strategies is an evidence-based practice for autism, and it's another one for responsible decision-making. And basically, you know, it's based on the belief that, that we are have cognitive processes that help us make decisions. Uh, we can examine our own thoughts and emotions and then use step-by-step -step strategies to think about, you know, how what we're thinking and our behavior and our self-awareness. 
it can be used with all of our students. So that's why this the beauty of this particular Castle 5 really is about meeting the needs and gaining access and equity for our individuals with autism as well. But I think all, all students need the opportunity to do this. And so this is one way we can increase access for our individuals with autism. We can use the sequential thinking tool. Um, and so oftentimes it's like everything happens to me and you kind of want to go, eh, not really, we all make choices. Um, and so we have situations and actions and they're saying, well, but that happened you know, to me because of these other things. And what we want to do is show really that um, we have some locus of control and what happens to us. And so I just want to kind of show you here. Uh, one thing we can do is we can start off with what is the situation? And we review this with our individuals so that we have a visual. We have, if they can read the uh, sentences there, but we can start putting in situations. The teacher assigned the list of 20 words. The test was scheduled for one week later. So what did you do? Oh, I made flashcards and I practiced them every night. And what was the outcome? I earned an A on the test. So we start showing them that there's a situation, that they engage in an action, and that this was the outcome. So we start shifting that there's a locus of control. And we're using these symbols and colors and also words to help support that for our individuals with autism. So once we have that down, you know, you do this, this is your action and your outcome. Now we start teaching and depicting well, what if this happened? So the teacher made, what if you played Nintendo and watched your favorite TV show instead? Oh, you're going to get a bad grade or no video. So you come up with different scenarios. But again, you can see there's a visual display. We're teaching them what if. But once again, showing them if you do this, this is the outcome. If you do this, this is the outcome. So giving them constantly that visual representation of what that would look like. And then toward the end, after we've kind of gotten them, we can start teaching them goals. And remember, we really want our individuals, all of our individuals in our schools, and especially individuals with autism, to have a sense of agency, that they can have goals and that they have tools on how to accomplish the goals and what those goals are. But we use these cognitive behavioral instructional strategies to lead them using the visuals, the colors, and sitting down and doing purposeful, strategized ways to teach them you do have the locus of control. And then we have action agency. So we help them desire their, their results and then they come up with the listing of it. So this is a process that would be very helpful for the SEL category of responsible decision-making. So what might your next steps be? So I would say, if I were you, <laughs> go find out if SEL is being implemented to address, you know, the social and emotional needs of your students and try to say, hey, I have some evidence-based practices that can support our students in accessing this program that we have going on at our school, our LEA, our county, wherever. And if it isn't, then share this information with your team. Say, hey, I think we should get on board with social emotional learning. Um, if evidence-based practices for autism is new for you, then go to the Captain website, start taking those free online Affirm modules. And then we would love for you to contact your local Captain Cadre and your regional implementation lead to learn more about all of our events and our supports that are available to you in your region. Um, and that's, the, again, the link. It's two places in the presentation on how to find your people, your Captain Cadre and your lead. You can always go to the Captain website. Everything's free. Everything's on there. We have publications. We have 27 evidence-based practice PowerPoint trainings on those evidence-based practices. And so you can go click on those and do those for self-learning or show them to others. Um, go to our Facebook page for sure. We have all kinds of every day we're just posting. Here's new information. Here's a new training. Here's the peers training that they're offering for free instead of $300. Okay, so here we go. We are four more minutes. I've left time for questions. And if you can't think of any right now or you need to get off and go somewhere else, um, you can write or email me or call me. And I want to thank you for taking the time to spend this afternoon with me. Any questions? 
Oh, look. Same here. Da, 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 da. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Any questions before I log off? I'm going to check the chat. And I'm being told there's a delay for the audience to answer. So Sung, is there anybody that wants their last question or else they can email me or call me or whatever? Send me a message through Facebook on our captain page. Okay, well, I don't see anything. I'm gonna go down one more time. Looks like we're finished. Thank you everyone for visiting with us. You're welcome, everyone. Sorry, the sound got weird. <laughs>